I was raised in a small cotton mill town of Lynette, Alabama. And I was born into a very uh, modest family. My daddy was a, was a grocer. And my mother died uh, when I was quite young, when I was three. I've always, you know, liked to have a project. I was about 16, 17, and, and I remember one time I planted a patch of peas across the road from my daddy's store and, uh, and grew peas one summer, and another time I grew turnip greens. The first time I met Millard was at a Young Democratic meeting at the University of Alabama, and afterwards I gave him a ride home. He told me he grew up on a small farm and he'd been selling various things to, to make a living. I had too. So we sat out in the car in front of his uh, apartment that night and talked to him nearly daylight and the next day we decided heck we need to go in business because we both had no money and our idea was to make all the money we could possibly make. I was uh, just finishing undergraduate and he was starting his first year in law school. Uh, I was married and he soon got a girlfriend Linda. I knew that when I married Millard he had the Midas touch, he had the skills and the talents to make things work. And it made us a fortune and we got everything that money will get for you. A big house, big cars, 2,000 acres of land, horses, cattle, speedboats. We had been living a very wealthy lifestyle. Um, Millard was in business and working night and day and weekends too, without much time for me or the kids. This wonderful young woman that I had married when I was a senior in law school, uh, Linda Caldwell, um, I ensconced her in a beautiful house with a brand new Lincoln Continental to drive and a maid and too many clothes to get in the closet, but she had no husband. Mm -hmm. uh, I was never home. Uh, I, sometimes I'd sleep at the office. It was just an unbridled quest for wealth. And uh, she and I drew apart and uh, she ended up leaving me and we, were, we came so close to, to our marriage disintegrating. And we had a breakthrough in our relationship and decided we did not want to break up our family. And I turned to Linda and I said, I think we should give everything we got away and make ourselves poor again and just throw ourselves on God's mercy and ask him to guide us. She didn't hesitate a minute. I didn't say this to him, but I sat there and listened to what he told me he was gonna do and I thought to myself, you're crazy as hell. I was surprised that he wanted to uh, sell me his interest in the company. And he said, he, well, he didn't want any of the money, he wanted to give it to projects that he believed in. And so for the next 10 years, uh, instead of paying him, I made the payments to the various projects that he wanted me to, to give the money to. And somebody once said, when the student is ready to learn, the teacher appears. And we were ready to learn, and the teacher appeared in the person of Clarence Jordan. This was a man I had never heard of in my life. He started with his wife, Florence, a small Christian community near America's Georgia called Cornelia Farm. He gave me insights into the incredible importance of incarnating God's Word in now. It wasn't called Habitat for Humanity in those days. Mm -hmm. We called it partnership housing, but the concepts were worked okay. out. Mm -hmm. We had the first house under construction, mm -hmm. and uh, he died suddenly, but I felt mm -hmm. by that point, I said, this is my life's calling. This is why I'm on this earth. And I'll never forget seeing him seated there at his desk. And it was obvious to me as soon as I saw him that he was dead. But then I literally remember uh, saying out loud, Clarence, you made it. You made it. You've been faithful uh, to your beliefs. You've been faithful to Christ, and uh, God has now called you home. God is big enough to take care of every problem. When we started the work that has become known as Habitat for Humanity down in southwest Georgia, people laughed at us. You know, because we said we're going to build thousands and thousands of houses. They said, ha, ha, ha. Where are you going to get all that money? I said, we're going to get it from God. They said, really, where are you going to get it? I said, we're really going to get it from God because the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That covers everything.
And God's money is just in the pockets of a lot of folks and we got to extract it. We got to extract it. When you meet Millard Fuller, it's impossible to not get drawn in to just his whirlwind of energy and the passion that he shares for providing decent housing for people. When you meet Millard Fuller and his wife Linda, you just get sucked into his energy. His story is unbelievable with Habitat for Humanity and now with the Fuller Center. I think he is probably one of the greatest leaders in America. And when he started building uh, the Fuller Center and I found that he was doing a project in the Chattahoochee Valley area, uh, I said I had to be a part of this. Millard was able to make people feel that they were better than they thought they were themselves. And he helped people realize that they could do things that they didn't think or know that they could do. I mean, his correspondence is legendary. I mean, you could probably fill a library if everybody, every note that he wrote to someone or dictated a letter or whatever, but he never missed an opportunity to tell people that he was inspired by them, uh, supported them. And I think that's really important. You know, I remember Millard as a, as a good friend and uh, as a person who was there when you needed him. I think that uh, people who are living in these homes, uh, maybe some didn't know Millard personally, but he was a friend to them uh, in a time of need. And I think that's is gonna be his legacy. One-on-one, -on -one, he was able to help a person in need. When Millard's talking about becoming a millionaire, that's in 1963, when that was a lot of money. Miller gave all that away, became unfettered, quit enduring life. And the truth of the matter is, died the wealthiest man on the face of earth. I don't know how anybody could have been wealthier.